Welcome to Story Chats at Inspire Romance. I'm Elizabeth Madry, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Narelle Atkins. I'm Valerie Comer. Rachel Russell is with us today to talk about her book, It's Your Love. Award-winning author Rachel D. Russell writes contemporary inspirational romance focused on forgiveness, redemption, and grace. She's a country girl living in the suburbs whose resume includes presenting live animal reptile programs, being a park ranger, a reserve police officer, and a stint in federal prison where she worked, not lived. Just to be clear, <laughs> she, <laughs> she makes wild attempts to balance writing under publisher deadlines with her full-time career with the federal government. When Rachel's not cantering her horse down the Oregon beaches, that sounds idyllic. She's probably mm. interrogating her husband on his own military and law enforcement experience to craft believable heroes in uniform. The rest of her time is spent enjoying her active family, including two college-age sons and three keyboard-hogging cats. Thank you for being here, Rachel. Thank you for having me. So we're going to start like we usually do by putting you right on the spot and saying, tell us a little bit about your book. <laughs> All right. Well, the book is titled It's Your Love, and it is the story about Grayson Fox, who is a, an Oregon cowboy from the town of Deep Haven, which readers may know Deep Haven is one of Susan May Warren's fictional towns. And um, I've been blessed to now write three full-length novels set in Deep Haven. And um, Grayson Fox returns to his hometown of Deep Haven, and he is going to run the youth horse camp for summer. And it turns out he's going to have to run it with Beth Strauss, who is, um, they have a history. <laughs> and, you know, for Beth, she's been uh, living small with her life. She made a promise to her dad when she was a kid. And in the fulfillment of that promise, she's she's basically denied everything that maybe God's been calling her to do because she has a very narrow definition of what, I mean, you know, keeping this, this childhood promise looks like. And uh, so the story follows them as they kind of overcome their own history because they do have a history and he's probably the last person she would want to be running this camp with, but yeah. she um, makes the best stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it's their story of, um, you know, they've each had very hard things happen in their past and, you know, how, how do we, um, move forward in life with those hard things that happen where is god when those hard things happen and um what do we you know what does our life look like um sometimes god has something better for us than we even imagined for ourselves That's true. Mm. so um one of the things that I found really fun about this this book, and you mentioned it as well, is that it is written in Susan May Warren's Deep Haven story world. Um, and I think because it is kind of unique, I think it would be cool if you would tell us a little about doing that. Um, do you feel that there were elements that were made harder than that or easier because of that? And do you feel like readers will have a better experience with your books if they've also read Susan's? Or... Um, does it not really matter? <laughs> that sort of thing. Sure. All <laughs> the above. Yeah. So, um, you know, the experience is itself. Um, the first two books written in Deep Haven were, you know, it's basically mentored by Susie through the process. It's a very unique, special process that is the um, template for her publishing company. And um, then it's like, this is kind of once you, once you've gone through that mentorship, this is where you, you go forth and you write, okay. um, more and you know, you've, you've left the nest, so to speak. Okay. So, um, I'm envisioning a mother bird, just given a big boot big to that push. baby. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. You know, like go, go fly, go, go do your thing. And so, you know, there, there's, there's kind of this juxtaposition because obviously I am not Susan May Warren and cannot <laughs> write exactly as Susan May Warren writes, you know, nor would God really want me to, we each have exactly. our own unique voice. Exactly. Um, mm. So, you know, there's this element, sometimes readers get a little, you know, confused whose story is this. And, you know, this, this is entirely, you know, I wrote, I wrote this novel, but it is written in her world. So I was able to draw her characters and um, use this backdrop. You know, the camp 
is a spinoff of Noah Standing Bear's camp that was um, one of her earlier books in the um, Deep Haven series. Okay. And so, so readers, um, readers will recognize if they've read all the books, they will recognize characters in there. And um, it might be a more fun read for them sure. to see where, the, what are those characters up to now? But, you know, Susie also taught us you don't bring a character on the page and not say who they are. <laughs> so right. somebody can also yeah. read this and understand who these characters are and, um, you know, kind of the the background there. It is, you know, super unique because in addition to writing in Susie's world, you know, I work with two other authors who are writing their own novels in this family series. So connecting, you know, we were literally texting and calling and video chatting with each other as we wrote these books like hey you know what's the layout of the bakery <laughs> yeah and yeah. what you know what is your character doing what you know because they're siblings and so um there's there's a lot of challenges in writing the book because you have reader expectations mm -hmm. you know um i have I have expectations of myself of what I want to produce that is in Susie's world. And that, you know, here I've had this amazing gift of being mentored by her. And, you know, she, she did the the edits, which meant she, she went through it and basically said, you need to rewrite a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> She's an amazing editor. She has that gift of seeing through my mess and being like, okay, uh let's let's kind of straighten these things out and then handing it back to me and I you know at first your head explodes and then you're just like okay I can and she's just, she's a great cheerleader so she's like I know you can do this I know you can do this and so um that's been amazing but having um you know having peers in that world is is a great support it also has the challenges mm -hmm. cuz we're working concurrently with each other while we're writing these books we have our expectations you know I have my expectations of what I want to deliver to Susie and um set in her world and then um I probably left out somebody else's expectations in there anyway but <laughs> so it, it's a lot it is it is a lot but it's, it's also just tremendous because readers have been um really welcoming and um just really um supportive of us in this this you know very unique venture so um I'm not sure if I answered all your questions there but... I think so I think you hit yes. them yeah no that's great that's a great little just... snapshot yeah that's very fun mm. all right Valerie I think you're next we have a disappearing Cooney but she's been around <laughs> really quite a long time she did <laughs> Uh, she's more affectionate today than some days. I don't know what she wants from me, but I guess I'll probably find out. Anyway, so the heroine's name is Beth. And um, you touched on this in as you introduced the book. But she made a promise to her dad when she was just a little girl. The night her mom left. Her mom didn't die. Her mom just abandoned the family. And she told her dad that she would never leave him. The child told her father right. that. So now she's in her mid-20s. I don't remember exactly how Right around she... 28. Yeah. Okay. Late-ish 20s. Yeah. And she is living with her dad. Mm -hmm. And she's doing all his cooking and all his cleaning and all his laundry and all his, pretty much all his companionship as well. And, um, and he's letting her. So this is part of the story. So we don't want to... Um, you know, we don't want to jump to the end and say, this is how it resolves. But <laughs> can we talk about healthy relationships between adults, kids, and their parents? And my frustration with them as I was reading was like, does neither of them see how unhealthy this is? <laughs> um, so can we talk about your thought processes of, of why you made her so extreme in that way? I realize it serves the story, but <laughs> well, and and it seems extreme, except it's really a slippery slope I find people fall into. I talked with some real people who had really lived this type of experience, maybe, um, you know, where they started out just being leaned on and right. um, the parental figure had... Um, their own insecurities yeah 
and really leaned on that, that child. And when you're in a position where, you know, again, this was something they grew into, it was a, like a slow fade. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like she at nine years old said, I am going to stay with my dad and do his cooking and do his cleaning and all these things. It was, um, forever and ever until I'm here we for dad. <laughs> and, you know, for him, he started out and it was just, he probably didn't even realize what she was doing for him. And, you know, what I found with the people I spoke with who were really in this real life situation was, you know, both parties on some level knew it wasn't ideal, but they kind of mistook what love meant. And usually there was one party that was, um, and truly it was often the parental piece of it, who put a lot of, um, whether unconscious or not, a lot of pressure on the child, even as they grew up, um, to stay with them. And that sense, well, I, I've raised you, don't leave me, I need you. And, you know, in a vacuum, we can look at that and say, that's a really unhealthy relationship. But people, right. it is really, you know, not uncommon or unfounded for parents to put those pressures on their children. They love their children. They want to be near their children. I would say most parents, if you ask them, Hey, when you raise your kids, when they turn 18, do you want them to leave and go across the country? <laughs> most parents would be like, I'd really love to be able to see my kids, even when they're an adult. So for Beth, you know, she's grown into this deep Haven is a tourist town. It's not super affordable enough, you know, in real life. And so why move out when she's got a perfectly good home with a room? You know, what's dad yeah. going to do? He's got an empty room in the house and she's not leaving town. So why move out? Oh, um, that's legit. That's going legit. off to yeah. college yeah. is super <laughs> scary. If you have somebody that's like, yeah, this is scary. Should we, you know, you don't have that person who's able to say, you can do this. Um, you know, I knew one person who had um, job opportunities to move across the country from her parents and it wasn't, you know, she lived independently, she was married and yet her parent, her was like, you're going to do that. Why would you want to live there? And it's just this subtle, you know, kind of, it wasn't meant to clip her wings, but it did. She didn't take opportunities she could have had if that parent had been able to say, you know, I don't know if this is the right decision for you, but you know, if you feel God's calling you to do it, go explore it. Because the parent was kind of in that spot. This was also a parent who had lost, lost a spouse. That parent was in that spot of seeing themselves alone. And right. that was scary. And they weren't in that healthy spot to be able to say go. So yes, it worked for the story, but it was definitely not, um, wildly fabricated like I, I spoke right. with very real people who had walked through some pieces of that and had to wrestle with um how do you break away and if you are in that position and you're the the child even if you're an adult uh it's really hard um you know you do become kind of codependent in that relationship and I think um at some point either something big happens um, they get counseling <laughs> if it's, you know, this really hard fast, yeah. um, or they, they continue to live, um, in that unhealthy environment. Yeah. Well, codependency breaks up marriages. I mean, I've known too many people that <laughs> have said at the end of the day, the relationship didn't work because, um, my spouse was just had way too much influence from one of their parents. And it was a choice between me and the parent and the parent won. And it's really sad, but I mean, that is very much what happens in real life. And I think with the grief that happened with the mother abandoning um, the family, I think they both got stuck in that grief is what I sort of perceived yeah. when I was reading the story. Right. And to me, that was very relatable. Like I could see why this was happening and why it was so hard. And I think um, usually children can go away and leave the nest, but then as the parents get elderly, you end up back in that relationship. It's like this full circle thing that happens. So I'm in a situation with my elderly mum where she's very dependent on me 
and it's not an unhealthy codependence. It's a, I really need help or I go into a nursing home situation. Yeah. So that's different. But I really appreciated the way you explored that codependency relationship. And I think that's also very relatable to readers. They'll look at that and say, oh, wow. And it wasn't that the dad was being really controlling because there are controlling parents that will right. no, be very selfish. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I really appreciated how it played out in the story. That was just my, my thing as I'm reading, especially in the earlier chapters. I'm like, man, I hope she addresses this because this is, <laughs> I just want to take these people and give them a good shake. But you know what? I wasn't apathetic to them. I cared. Yeah. I wanted them to see the light, you know, as, as I see the light. Right. Which see of course is the light. right way. <laughs> um, so, so it was, it, it provoked a response and that's, Sometimes that's what we're really that's what you sorry, readers. Sometimes yeah. that's what we're really looking for <laughs> as authors is to make our our readers actually care. Yeah. Um, yes. About what's happening, and and that's not completely unhealthy, <clears throat> unless it is. <laughs> we're too dependent on <laughs> readers' input on that, but exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely had an opinion, and I definitely cared, and so, so that's that's a win. Yeah. for you thank you <laughs> yes I, I'm kind of coming around that sideways but but I did care excellent yeah go ahead Narelle yeah Narelle. it is well well I really enjoyed the story and I appreciated the aspect we've just discussed in detail because sometimes you can go to a story and it's a nice light fun read and sometimes there's a bit more depth and I appreciate the depth that you went into with the um father-daughter relationship I thought that was very well done but anyway we're going to talk about Grayson so Grayson's the cowboy from Oregon and he's returning home to Deep Haven and he has he's only there for a really short time he's filling in at the camp as the wrangler right. and that's a camp a horse camp I just it's, I found all this completely fascinating it's completely <laughs> foreign to me so I really enjoyed it um so at the start of the story where's Grayson sitting in his faith journey and why is the camp important to him let's talk about that okay so Grayson um Grayson has lost both his parents when he was young and this was to a, a tragic in a tragic accident um so at that point you know um he'd grown up in a in a christian home but you know he's lost his he lost his parents at a young age um a little adrift his his entire identity has you know been lost to him and this camp he didn't even want to go to but he ended up going to this campus as, as a youth and it hugely impacted his life because the relationship he was able to have with horses um and I love horses. I have a horse. I've been horse crazy my entire life. And um, to me, there's something very uniquely special about horses and they're often used in therapy programs. There, There's just, I mean, you have this large beast who is willing to be a partner with you and let alone let you climb on its back and direct its feet where to go. And so Grayson had this experience as a youth um, meeting horses. And for him, it not only taught him about horses, which set the trajectory for his career, but it gave him that safe place where he could mm. um, grieve. And he didn't know exactly, you know, he wasn't able to process all of it, but it helped him process enough that he didn't go off the rails. You know, you know, he, he was he had some sense of like where he needed to go. So he heads to Oregon as an adult and he's, you know, still, he, you know, he's not really close to God, but he's, you know, he's got the horses. So those are like, that's his connection. And um, while he's in Oregon, he is kind of just flitting around in relationships, keeping everything very casual because he knows how much it hurts to lose somebody you love. He's just not willing mm. to go there and um he ends up um there's another tragedy that takes place he does end up getting back to back into church his faith is um tender though and it's not deeply rooted yet so when he comes back to deep hmm. haven he thinks it's a little deeper than it really is but it's kind of like that sense of i'll trust god 
this far because I'm not sure that he has the same plan I have. And I like my plan better because it's more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And his plan might hurt. (laughs) His plans might hurt because they've hurt in the past. So he's in this, this, um, you know, kind of gray area where he, he goes to church now and he, you know, professes himself as a believer, but he's not quite ready to surrender and trust that even in the darkest hours, God is still with him. Yeah. Yeah. And And that was a big journey, wasn't it? In the story. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Go, Valerie. I interrupted you. Yeah, you were no. about to say something. <laughs> no? I, okay. <laughs> are you writing more books set in Oregon? Because that seems to be where your both your body and your heart are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or are you going to be writing strictly in uh, Deep Haven? Um, at this point in time, I I'm not writing anymore in Deep Haven. I'm um, taken a little detour I do have another book under contract that's not in Oregon um but my my heart is really to write stories in Oregon and um the just you know writing what you know and love horses Oregon the country um are really dear and dear to me and um I I have a few books I wrote before I got my first contract that I'm hoping to kind of rewrite and polish that take place in Oregon and we'll see what they have, what happens with them in the future. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Very good. So um, that kind of, well, it sort of touched on what's next for you. um, But do you have any more to expand on that? (laughs) Um. So yeah, I, I'm under contract for a novel that will release in 2025. The um, I don't think I can say too much about the project yet, but yeah. I can say yeah. it takes place in a new story world. Okay. And um, like it's never been seen before story world. It'll oh, be part ooh. of a, of a, of a series. And um, but it's uh, you know, again, small town contemporary this romance. This time you get to help create it. Yes, yes. There's some parameters that were given. And so it's a very interesting, um, very interesting endeavor, but I'm, I'm finishing up plotting it. And then um, my manuscripts due in spring. So I'll be cranking out a manuscript over (laughs) winter. (laughs) And is this with Susan May Warren again? It is with Sunrise Publishing. Yeah, yeah, with Sunrise. Excellent. Okay, very cool. And uh, let everyone know where they can find you. Sure. They can find me on Instagram at, uh, what is it? Rachel D. Russell writes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And on Facebook at Rachel D. Russell fiction. Okay. All right. Do you have anything that you wish we had hit that we didn't? Not that I can think of. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Well, we really, really, really appreciate you letting us read the book and then coming and chatting with us about it. Um, it's always yes. super fun. So oh, thank you. Um, thank you for it was really me. fun to have you. And thank you guys all who are watching and listening for tuning in this week. Um, we'd love to know your thoughts. Have you read It's Your Love? Are you going to? Have you been uh, keeping up with all the new Deep Haven books um, from Sunrise Publishing? Leave us a comment on YouTube. Um and gosh, I got off script again. <laughs> I, I should do that. You can notifications. Find on, yes, yes. <laughs> while you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the, the bell so you um subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. My goodness, go. I'm losing my mind. There it is. So we will look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, in the meantime, don't forget to fall in love with a good book. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.